three stars in three different decades. Actress Rebecca Schaefer. I think she had enormous potential. Tejano music sensation Selena Quintanilla Perez. Five minutes in the room, you were a fan. And YouTube singing sensation Christina Grimmie. She was a tiny little girl, and man, that voice is big. As different as these artists were, one thing unites them. They were taken far too soon, at the brink of their success, when fan adoration <laughs> turned deadly. I knew how many people loved Christina. I just didn't know to the extent. She reached millions of people. They were all very open and loving and the kind of people who attracted millions of fans. For some fans, the line between fantasy and reality can become increasingly blurred. Evil can creep into your home and you don't know that evil is there. Artists on the brink of superstardom, taken down by fans who believe they were intimately connected to them. I just couldn't believe it. She would give anything for her fans, and then a fan has to take her life. He goes, Jose, I'm telling you, my daughter's gone. Exclusive interviews reveal the truth behind three lives cut tragically short by the very people who claim to love them. This is their story. Not everyone born with talent has the drive to reach fame. These three women had both the gift and the passion. They succeeded against all odds, but the fame they reached attracted the unwanted attention of three obsessed fans. One such talent was Rebecca Schaefer. Schaefer caught the acting bug at the age of 16, moving to New York to pursue her dreams of stardom. Her mother was remarkable. She let her go to New York because she trusted Rebecca would make the right decisions, because Rebecca was kind, she was honest. If somebody gave you some kit of all the parts to make a daughter, she would be it. Within months, Rebecca had landed her first role on the soap opera, One Life to Live. Dad, I trusted you with my life. Can't you please trust me? The soap brought Schaefer to the attention of CBS, who realized her potential, casting the 19-year-old actress as Pam Dauber's younger sister in the series, My Sister Sam. Hi, I'm Patty Russell, and this is my sister Sam. I just moved in. I think she had enormous potential. Her humor was surprising. It would sort of come out of left field, and the base of it was a real innocence and a curiosity. Sam, what's going on here? Some kind of secret meeting? No! <laughs> she would love it when people would come up and ask her to sign an autograph. She didn't pretend to be very cool and, you know, oh, I can't now, oh, I'm busy. She had the energy of a woman and the innocence of a child. But I think she knew she was going to be a star. Delighted by her newfound fame, Schaefer told Hollywood reporter journalist Sue Cameron about the flood of fan mail she was receiving. Look, I'm getting fan mail, and it's great, and I'm answering them back, and it's wonderful. And I went, wait a minute, you can't do that. They're not your friends. Cameron's advice proved eerily prophetic. When a 16-year-old with a family history of mental illness named Robert Bardo reached out to the rising starlet. This looks to be a case of erotomania, a delusional belief that there exists a real relationship with a celebrity. Bardo believes he is in a relationship with Rebecca Schaefer. He began to obsessively write her fan letters, telling her how much he loved her and sending her gifts. Rebecca Schaefer sent back a form response that she had autographed. For Bardo, it was like a personal message. He actually goes from Tucson, where he lives, to Hollywood, to the production lot where they are filming My Sister Sam. Oblivious to the growing danger, Schaefer focused on her career, landing a role in Paul Bartel's quirky bedroom farce, Scenes from the Class Struggle in Beverly Hills, playing a sexually adventurous 20-something. My idea of taking a risk is losing my birth control pills or, or shopping at sex without a sale. And she was like, you come like a whore and 
kind of warned me because they kind of betrayed Mr. Manager. It's as if someone has spoiled his Rebecca and replaced her with this other person. And so there is a loss of this idealized person. The rage that emerges from that often then results in this violent acting out. Bardo hired a private investigator who was easily able to find Schaefer's home address using DMV records. Now it seems crazy that somebody would be able to get somebody's personal information by going through the DMV. But at the time, there were no barriers to that. He decides he's going to go to her home, and he's going to take a gun. Rebecca was auditioning for the career-making role of Al Pacino's daughter in The Godfather Part Three. Rebecca was expecting the script that she would need for her audition. So that might be why she just opened the door to this stranger thinking that he was delivering this script. I introduced myself. I'm Robert Bartle. I'm from Tucson, Arizona. I'm the fan Rebecca excused herself to prepare for her audition. A few minutes later, Bardo returned. What's the next time, you know? Like, I thought that was a great costume. It was an angel thing. It was just wrong. Grab, grab it on the chair. Boy, here. She's gone. Why? Why? Bardo fled the scene, leaving Schaefer dying on the steps of her West Hollywood apartment building. The following day, Police in Tucson, Arizona found Bardo running in traffic on Interstate 10, screaming that he had killed Rebecca Schaefer. He was apprehended and returned to Los Angeles to await trial. But the trial did not last long. He was capable of premeditation. I made my decision immediately after I'd heard all the evidence. Life without possibility of parole. Rebecca Schaefer's family were there when the verdict was read. He'll be in there for the rest of his life, thank God. Rebecca Schaefer's case was sort of the turning point for us to start talking about stalking. It created the very first anti-stalking law, which worked to try and punish the stalkers before it got any worse. And now we have the Driver's Privacy Protection Act saying that no one could get private addresses out of DMV records. Another huge step forward. Here was a trusting young girl whose doorbell rang and she answered it. She was going to be a huge star. I think she would have been one of the biggest. In 1990, the anti-stalking law was passed in Rebecca's honor. But no such law could protect young pop legend Selena from the erotomaniac hiding in plain sight in her inner circle, who would gun her down at the pinnacle of her career in 1995. How you doing, Houston? At the age of 23, Selena was a legend in the making. After winning four Billboard Latin Music Awards and a Grammy, she was poised to become a crossover pop star of epic proportions. She could draw you in. Five minutes in the room, you were a fan, and you felt like you knew her forever. She was a hybrid of Madonna, Janet, Mariah, Gloria Stefan, and at the same time, unlike any other artist. In 1980, at his Mexican restaurant in Lake Jackson, Texas, Abraham Quintanilla paired his six-year-old daughter, Selena, with her two older siblings to form a family band called Selena y Los Dinos. They performed everything from Diana Ross to Supertramp. Selena's early promise blossomed, and her father made a decision that would set 10-year-old Selena on the path to superstardom. Tackling the male-dominated genre of Tejano music, made popular by bands like the Texas Tornadoes and La Mafia. The fact of the matter is, she grew up here. Spanish was a second language to her. ¿Cómo lo, cómo lo hicieron, cómo lo pintaron, nomás? Muy paint. ¿Cómo saben qué hicieron? Uh, los pintaron. <laughs> <laughs> She learned Spanish phonetically. She was more focused on the emotion behind it. Her music transcended language, and she had a personality that was infectious. Everybody loved Selena. Her brother told me to go see them play. I was a little starstruck. I just remember her face, her laughter. Just an amazing soul, an amazing spirit. Shortly after that, her brother called me and asked if I was ready to join the band. Sé que tú no puedes, 
When we started going into Mexico, things just got so much bigger. Selena built on her early success. Selena Quintanilla. Winning the respect of the Latin music industry and multiple awards. You're spoiling me. In 1989, 18-year-old Selena was becoming the queen of Tejano music, but she was still not signed to a major label and had very little mainstream notoriety. I had just opened up EMI Latin, and I had no artists, I had nothing. We go to the Tejano Awards, I've had enough, and I get up and I start leaving, and as I get to the doors, I hear this massive roar. And I turn around, and Selena's on stage. I was with a colleague, and we looked at each other, and we said, wow, and it clicked. I was determined to make her the first signing at EMI. I saw a star. I thought she was going to be the next Gloria Estefan. She was a role model for all Spanish-speaking little girls in Texas. It wasn't only young girls who admired the newly minted Latin superstar. At a 1991 performance in San Antonio, Texas. Oh my goodness, you people are such a party. Selena caught the eye of a 31-year-old registered nurse named Yolanda Saldivar, who tracked down the singer's father, Abraham. She had left quite a few messages on my recorder, wanting to start a fan club in the San Antonio area for Selena. Those messages put Selena on a collision course with Yolanda Saldivar. When she first came to our circle, we accepted her as a friend. Yolanda opened up about her desire to start the fan club. Going through my college years, I had no social life. I had voted myself to my university, my career, my, my license. Now it was time for me to have fun. So tell me about your first meeting. Like meeting Whitney Houston. <laughs> Coming up. She trusted this woman at one point, and all that went south. And later. I was at her funeral. There probably was not a white rose left in the entire state of Texas. By the early 90s, 22-year-old Selena's career and personal life were taking off. She fell in love with band guitarist Chris Perez. She taught me a lot. Like, just simple things. Like, I used to never tell people I love them, you know, or I miss them, or just give them gifts just because. I learned those things and, and many, many other things from her. The couple married on April 2nd, 1992. In 1993, Selena recorded a live album for EMI Latin in front of 3,000 fans at the Memorial Coliseum in Corpus Christi, Texas. But without an English-speaking album, she was still an unknown in the United States. Gracias. In my book, I write a lot about how smart she was and how business savvy she was. She had plans to someday create a brand. So in 1994, Selena focused her attention on a new venture hiring designer Martin Gomez to create clothing for her boutique, Selena, etc. She was beyond just a singer. Entertaining was her job, fashion was her passion. But with a demanding performance schedule, Selena needed someone to manage the boutiques. Yolanda Saldivar had earned Selena's trust after she established Selena's fan club and became part of her family. So, Selena offered the job to Yolanda. Yolanda was engaged in behaviors to close the gap between them by becoming the fan club president and then actually finding her way in reality into Selena's life. She had access to the business accounts. She even had a key to Selena's house. So now she felt very much like she was a part of Selena's life to the point where she started leaving her old life behind and making it all about Selena. Yolanda's unhealthy infatuation with Selena came to light when later that year, Martin Gomez sent an assistant to pick something up from Yolanda's house. When the assistant returned, she told Gomez that Yolanda had dozens of pictures and posters of Selena on her walls. Being a fan of someone is one thing, but to have every poster of that person on their wall, listen to their music nonstop, make reference to that person in their lives, that celebrity, becomes central to their identity. Evil can creep up into your home and you don't know that evil is there. Yolanda later claimed that she and Selena had a warm mother-daughter relationship. She saw herself as a protector, caregiver, that they have this special relationship in which Selena needed her in the same way as patients need a nurse. 
Selena must have looked to Yolanda as a very steady, trustworthy character. She worked hard for her, was devoted to her. So far, she hasn't shown me any reason why I should suspect her of anything but worthy of trust. While Yolanda viewed herself as a mother figure, those closest to Selena were increasingly concerned about Saldivar's strange behavior. We were this video shoot and she's bossing people around. And this wasn't the first time that we had heard this. The other employees complain of Yolanda's bizarre behavior, saying that she's abusive to them if they try to talk to Selena. You know, evil creeped up. I experienced evil in this situation and I didn't say anything. And I, I should have maybe, but I didn't. I didn't. As Yolanda's obsession was intensifying, Selena's talents were reaching new heights and her dreams were starting to manifest. In 1994, Selena was nominated for her first Grammy in the Best Mexican American Album category for Selena Live. The Grammy goes to... Live, Selena. Thank you for having faith in me, I love you, thank you. Hot off her Grammy win, Selena released her fourth studio album, Amor Prohibido, cementing her superstar status in Latin music. Selena believed the time was right to take her career to the next level with an English language album. We had been talking about the English album for quite a while. And one day, in the middle of the conversation, she just breaks down and starts to cry and said, Jose, we've been talking about my English language album for three years. What she didn't know is that I was getting rejection on all fronts. And I called my boss. I said, I can't hold her back any longer. We need to move because she's going to make a deal with Universal Music. What nobody has ever known is that I made that up. She wasn't going to Universal and there was no deal. And I lied. And I have no regrets about doing that. One year after her Grammy win for Selena Live, the singer finally got the green light and started recording her crossover album in 1995. Everybody just felt it would be a home run because of her, because of her talents, because of Selena the person. We went through a couple of songs that I'd written and we picked two. I Can Fall In Love was the first one. And so she made a trip back to record that song and uh, she said, I'll see you guys in two weeks. As Selena prepared to record her crossover album, Yolanda's work for the star became suspect when Selena's father began to notice discrepancies in the books for both the fan club and the fashion business. Yolanda had taken up some funds from the employees to give Selena a present. And later on, we found out that she paid with Selena's uh, corporate card. A closer look revealed that there was over $60,000 missing from the boutique and fan club embezzlement would prove to be only the first act of Yolanda's betrayal. Coming up, a fateful meeting. I don't think Selena saw this coming for one minute. We're coming. We have a woman ran in the lobby, said she's been shot. Selena's meteoric rise to stardom in the Latin music industry paved the way for her ambitious crossover into mainstream music in 1995. By mid-March, the singer was halfway through recording her first English language album. Record execs were certain Selena was poised to take her place alongside pop giants like Madonna. Selena's potential at that time could have been through the roof. The all English speaking album, I thought that was gonna bring it to the next level. She was super excited. This had been her dream. I knew that dream was gonna come true. It was inevitable. I mean, you cannot stop a talent like hers. While Selena was poised to conquer the mainstream market, Yolanda Saldivar's obsession with the singer turned to panic as she scrambled to deny allegations she had embezzled more than $60,000 from the singer's boutique and fan club. Yolanda was confronted about the alleged embezzlement. Did you steal any money from Selena's business? No, ma'am. Not ever. Can you tell me if you were angry, frustrated? No, I was never angry. I was never frustrated. We were going to fire her, but I wasn't going to prosecute her. I was frustrated because we knew that she was lying. The family told Yolanda, you can no longer have contact with Selena. You are cut off. For Yolanda, that was catastrophic because Selena was her life. Yolanda cannot tolerate losing the position she has as being special to Selena's life. 
there's such rage in that rapture. She has to get rid of her. Never in my wildest dream did I think that this woman was going to react this way. On March 31st, 1995, Yolanda asked Selena to meet her at a Days Inn in Corpus Christi to talk about the misunderstanding. She told Selena to come alone. She had some financial papers that Selena would need for her businesses. Very manipulative, very smart carrot to hang out for Selena. Selena thought nothing of it to go on her own over there to confront her, which was a mistake. So Selena agreed to meet Yolanda. But before Yolanda gave the papers, she actually talked Selena into taking her to the hospital. Once again, a very manipulative move. She said that she had been raped and needed to go get an examination. So Selena, being kind, took Yolanda to the hospital. They did the examination, and there was no evidence that she'd been raped. The story that Yolanda created about having been raped seems to me as an act of trying to close that gap between the two of them, to maintain contact and not lose the connection. Selena and Yolanda returned to the Days Inn at around 11 that morning. At 11.48, guests heard two women arguing loudly. I don't think Selena saw this coming for one minute. I can only see her going, look, uh, I know what you did is wrong. We'll figure it out. We'll work it out. I know that at one time she thought highly of this woman. She trusted her, and all that went south. Just before noon, a single gunshot rang out. While hotel staff tried to stop the bleeding, police and an ambulance were hurrying to the scene where Yolanda had barricaded herself in her truck. Local reporters began covering the tense standoff. The assistant police chief tells us that they now provided the suspect with a telephone. Selena was taken away in an ambulance and rushed to a nearby hospital. As she fought for her life, a police negotiator arrived at the Days Inn Motel where Yolanda held a gun to her head and refused to come out. We trust and glad that she's going to come out. And everything will be okay in the eyes of Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm going to give her the gun. I'm going to tell her, I'm going to kill myself. And as I pulled it out, it just went out because the barrel was back. I didn't mean to do it. I did it. The most likely scenario is that in experiencing the loss of that idealized relationship, she wanted to kill off that Selena, the one that was disappointed in her, the Selena that was angry at her. She wanted that Selena gone. In a 1995 interview with 2020, Yolanda revealed why she surrendered. Why didn't you commit suicide when you were in the car all those nine and a half hours? I hear her tell me, you don't commit suicide because I'll never see you in heaven. That is such a telling statement of what was going on in Yolanda's head, this delusion that even though she'd shot Selena, that Selena still loved her. Coming up, Selena fights for her life. I get a phone call. And he says to me, Selena was shot. And later, another talented young woman on the verge of stardom cut down by an obsessed fan. Trevor, now in one. Somebody just uh, opened fire at the side of the line. He shot at one of the singers. Singing sensation Selena was shot by Yolanda Saldivar on March 31st, 1995. The singer was taken to a nearby hospital and pronounced dead at 1.05 p.m. She was 23 years old. I get a phone call, and it's Abraham. And he says to me, my daughter's gone. I said, what do you mean? What do you mean she's gone? He said, Jose, she's gone. She's gone. I was actually working on her track, and I walked out to the middle area 
of the studio and my studio manager came up and said, Selena's dead. And I said, what? And I had a physical pain in my heart. I'll never forget that. I was at her funeral. There probably was not a white rose left in the entire state of Texas. Now I'm getting emotional. <laughs> uh, when I talk about her, it's very hard. It was traumatic. It was the hardest thing up until that point that I had ever had to go through. I, I missed her face, her laughter. She was just an amazing soul, an amazing spirit. I heard fans that are like, how could we let that happen? Come on now, like you think that I would let anything happen to her, like seriously? Like none of us thought that that was even a possibility. On the road, we had security. So I never really feared for her safety. You know, especially the way it happened to her. The fact that one of her friends did that. It's just unbelievable. But death would not stop Selena's star from rising, nor silence her talent. The world all of a sudden wanted to hear Selena. Doing the English record, that was always like the next big goal for her. It felt like we had to finish it. We had to make a release date within a month. And we were just sitting at the control boards crying, trying to mix these songs. Them pushing play for me to record the guitar tracks and to hear her voice come out of the speakers in the studio, it was just painful to go in and have to create parts and make them sound a certain way when really inside you're just dying. I remember for the first time having to listen to Dream of You, which to this day I don't listen to. I've been in the car with my daughters. When it comes on, they know that we changed that. It's, it's very sad for me to hear that. The record debuted at number one. But she wasn't here to see that with us. And, it, and it's, it's just not right. It wasn't right then, it's not right today. Seeing it at number one just confirmed everything that I thought. You know, it, it was a bittersweet thing, you know? I, my friend, my buddy is gone, but when I'm, I'm listening to her sing on the radio and it's our song, you know? It's like, it was hard. She unfortunately didn't get to see her dream come true. There was no way she was not going to be the next Gloria. Who would ever think of harming this woman? She was cuckoo in the head, obviously, as we've come to find out. Seven months after Selena was murdered, Yolanda Saldivar went to trial. She said that she was going to that hotel room to cut things off with Selena. And when she told Selena that Selena dropped to the ground and pulled on her feet and begged her not to end the relationship. This is classic erotomania, where you're now projecting your delusion on this other person and saying that they're the one with this intense love affair going towards you. On October 23rd, 1995, jurors found Saldivar guilty of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole until 2025. Most people, if you lose somebody in your family, you grieve, right? And, and you go through your process and you get to pick and choose when you want to think about it. I couldn't do that. I had no control. I could be in a whole other headspace and then boom, a song comes on. Like it just all falls down again and you have to start over. But look at all the amazing things she left us in that short amount of time. In the years since her death, Selena's iconic status has only grown. With a 1997 biopic starring Jennifer Lopez and a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In 2020, the singer's album, Ven Conmigo, was selected by the Library of Congress to be included in their National Recording Registry. What an honor for her to have those phonographic recordings preserved at the Library of Congress. That's pretty huge. Now I get to hear the songs and relate the joy that people feel and not just the pain that I was feeling at the time that I was recording them. She brings families together, you know, from generation to generation. 
we're all proud of her and the things that she keeps on accomplishing. Coming up, a YouTube singing sensation comes face to face with a deranged fan. She was reaching out to hug the person who murdered her. It just says so much about her. In the age of social media, the lines between stars and fans have become increasingly blurred with little to no boundaries. This newfound accessibility can increase a star's popularity, but also open the door to unwanted obsession. The deranged fan can now intensify their delusional fantasy in ways that didn't exist in the days of Rebecca Schaefer. This enhanced erotomania led to tragedy for YouTube star Christina Grimmie. When you're making videos in your home and people are watching them in their homes, they feel a sense of intimacy with you that they don't feel with traditional celebrities. She really was this 17-year-old girl making videos in her mom and dad's house. That's why people really resonated with her because she was just one of us. I interviewed her on so many occasions. I ran into one of my favorite friends from YouTube, Christina Grimmie. I'm a favorite, I feel really special. When I think of her, I think of her really as a friend. The key to Christina's down-to-earth personality was that she got very well known in the gaming community. The 3DS. We're 15 months apart. I'm the older brother. She's my younger sister. And I was always player one. She was always player two. So I got a 1P on my right arm, and she had 2P in the same spot on her left arm. She was always a really good singer, and she excelled at things she put her mind to. In 2009, at the age of 15, Christina uploaded her very first singing video. And like Selena, her talent at a young age was undeniable. Maybe it's the things I say. She can hit those notes like Christina Aguilera, she can do runs like Mariah, but she's a tiny little girl, and man, that voice is big. She was a hardcore introvert. Getting to that point of being able to express herself comfortably was tough, so YouTube really helped her come into her own. When I look into your eyes, through 2012, Grimmie continued to post covers of hit songs requested by fans, including songs by Nelly and David Guetta. It proved a winning formula that made Christina the fourth most subscribed musician on YouTube. I think that came out of a time where artists were controlled by labels to some extent. And here comes Christina and says whatever she feels and just gets this big fan base of people who love her for being herself. I love my fans and it just makes me feel like maybe I have a shot one day. There is one word that as far as I know, she made up herself. Friends. Um, you guys rock so hard. Friend, which is a mixture of the word fan and friend. I love you and thank you for supporting me and you never know, maybe I'll get a Grammy one day. <laughs> oh my goodness, are you my fan? <laughs> but hidden among the many fans who celebrated Grimmy's success was the dangerously obsessed Kevin Loibel. Best Buy tech Keith Moran described his coworker in a 2018 interview. He was an advanced repair agent, which is basically the highest level of uh, computer repair tech there. Highly intelligent guy. We invited him out places and stuff like that. He just didn't care to have much of an outside social life. Like Robert Bardo and Yolanda Saldivar, Loibel had many of the characteristics of erotomania. Kevin Loibel didn't have very many friends. He was so socially awkward that they had to put him in an area of the store where he didn't have much contact with uh, customers. Best friend Corey Dennington would later tell the Orlando police that he was the only person who knew anything about Kevin's growing obsession with Christina Grimmie. He told me, if there is a God, he sees it in her. He'd be going home after work, watching her. Oblivious to any danger brewing, Christina continued her rise on social media, entering the 2011 My YouTube competition, coming in seconds behind another aspiring music star, Selena Gomez. Selena's mom, Mandy, offered to manage the fledgling singer's career, and Christina announced her first album release in 2011. With Mandy and Selena's help, 
Grimmy quickly went from digital darling to mainstream media rising star, appearing on The Ellen Show in 2011. I get a phone call. She's like, I think we're going to be on Ellen. And I was like, what? We did a cover of How to Love, and I think that's her best cover. Um. <laughs> See, you had a lot of crooks trying to steal your heart. Never really had love. Couldn't never figure out I love. Christina's star was climbing fast when she auditioned for The Voice in 2014, winning the heart of coach Adam Levine singing a cover of the Miley Cyrus anthem, Wrecking Ball. To me, it's one of the best, if not the best, cover song ever done by an unknown artist. I came in like the wrecking ball. I never hit so hard in love. All I wanted was to break your walls. All you ever did was to break me. Yeah. It was really cool to just see the difference of how she was super respected in this underground community and then validated by one of the biggest shows in the world. Wow. The third place singer was our girl, Christina Grimmie. She's been a friend of ours on the show for a really long time, so full disclosure, she had my vote. After taking third place on The Voice, Christina went on to win the iHeartRadio Rising Star competition in 2015. The first time we got together to write, it felt like becoming really good close friends. She would share a story of a fan that got to meet her. She'd say, hey, we're going to eat after the show. Do you want to come with us? And I'd be like, <laughs> you know, really? I'm always here for you because you're always here for me. As Christina's star continued to rise, Kevin Loebel's obsession deepened. The LASIK eye surgery, the hair surgery. Uh, he was losing weight to become a professional streamer with video games. And then that would lead him to meet her. Kevin Loebel engages in all this transformation. The idea being, becoming her dream person would be the route to getting close to her. Coming up, the road to that fateful day narrows. I jump on the guy immediately screaming at him. He just throws me off like it's nothing. And the darkest side of fame. I get a message from my sister. I can't believe what happened to Grimmy. sensation Christina Grimmie was on the brink of superstardom. But along with fame came the unwanted attention of erotomaniac Kevin Loebel. I've been watching a lot of fan videos just now and you're legitimately making me cry because I love you guys so much. Kevin Loebel, he'd already moved it into his mind as sort of like this untouchable sort of preserved thing that he wanted to hold on to and was not interested in reality puncturing that fantasy bubble in any way. Similar to Bardo before him, Kevin Loebel's descent into obsession and erotomania was seemingly sparked by a perceived portrayal. She started dating this guy and had just posted a picture of her and Steven on social media, which supposedly set this gunman off. In early June, Christina Grimmie posted this message. Please come to the show if you live near Orlando, Florida. Uh, we are at the Plaza Live. Please come out. Bye. How was he that day? He's like, I love you, brother. And he grabbed my shoulder. He's told me he's tired. He's ready to ascend. At 7 p.m. on the evening of June 10th, 2016, 22-year-old Christina Grimmie took the stage at the Plaza Live in Orlando, Florida. During the concert, Kevin Loebel was captured on security cameras at the back of the venue, waiting for the after-concert meet-and-greet. Christina's brother, Marcus, later described the tragic events that followed. Greet, normal night, concert's over. Concert's over, I'm getting ready, just selling merch. She's meeting people. So Marcus, did you hear like any statements the guy made before? She said nothing, nothing. literally nothing. She considered her fans sincerely and genuinely to be her friends. She just wanted to give this guy a hug, <laughs> you know, at her meet and greet. I just walked up, it just happened. I hear a shot, and I'm looking, more shots. I jump on the guy immediately screaming at him, and he just throws me off like it's nothing. 
Burns now in one. Open fire! I've been fired alive! He shot at one of his fingers! He shot three times! At approximately 10.45 p.m., officers received shots fired. We know that her brother tackled the suspect, and that's when the suspect shot himself. Christina was rushed to the Orlando Regional Medical Center with multiple gunshot wounds to her head and chest. I get a message from my sister saying, I can't believe what happened to Grimmy. And I'm going, what, what happened to Grimmy? And within a half an hour, we heard that she had, had died. And I mean, it was crushing. The only way I can reconcile any of that is just like, she was a person of faith. She just really, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sorry at all, actually. I'm just trying to process this whole thing. She would give anything for her fans, and then a fan has to take her life. That was horrible. The concept that still makes me get emotional, that she was reaching out to hug the person who murdered her, it just says so much about her. Just a genuine, loving spirit. Her not being there anymore was just really tough, but definitely it brought us closer together as a family. It's just something that kind of made me appreciate life a lot more. In the weeks that followed, fans poured out their love, grief, and gratitude with thousands of social media posts and photos. Above all, I'm so grateful that her fans have kept her legacy alive. In 2017, Christina Grimmie's family established a foundation in her name to provide resources for families devastated by gun violence. The Pulse nightclub shooting happened two days after. That really just hit me so hard because of how many families were changed forever and they didn't have the support that we had. Selena, Rebecca, and Christina all interacted with their public in a way that only increased the love fans felt for them. They were all very open and loving, and the kind of people who attracted millions of fans. For three of those fans, a delusion of connection fueled by erotomania ended in violence and tragedy. While we will never know the heights Selena, Rebecca, or Christina might have reached had they lived, there is no denying the legacy their talent and their lives left behind. Selena became a phenomenon. I think that she reached those people deeply, and to this day continues to do that. Rebecca was terrific. You don't have people like that in your life all the time. She was very innocent in her outlook about life, and it reflected in the way she was with people. And I miss her, and I know she's hearing us, and we sure love you, Rebecca. If I had the opportunity to say something to Christina, I would just say thank you for being someone that paved the way for so many people in a way that was kind and sincere. Oh gosh, it gets me still. One of the biggest things is just kind of hearing people say like, oh, just the way she made me feel, I want to make other people feel that way too.